the 1970s were really cruel to Chrysler. Eh, oil embargo, products that were large, heavy, rear-wheel drive, V8, beset by quality problems and recalls, and they were on the brink of bankruptcy. Into this, at the beginning of the 80s, strode the K car, boxy and proud, and single-handedly saved Chrysler. I think this may be the most influential platform ever developed in the automotive world. And Lee Iacocca will forever be associated with the K car. But interestingly, the story does not begin with him. So today, let's talk a little bit about the history, the K car, its impact, what it spawned, and what it actually means. So stay tuned. So first off, welcome back. If you haven't been here, please click that subscribe button and give me a like here. It really helps me with the YouTube algorithm. Also, I have been advised in the comments by a few people to say I am not a mechanic and everything here is my own opinion. I am not trying to give you a history of the K car, all of its derivatives and all of the multiple engines and transmissions and bodies and everything else. I wanna talk in general about Chrysler and the K car and its impact not only on Chrysler Corporation, but kind of the, the world of automotive, as it were. And it doesn't start with Lee Iacocca. Now, Iacocca was, and if you're one of those people who are like, where are you getting your information from? Right here. As well as other articles I find online, of course. But Iacocca, of course, rose to president of Ford, and his boss was Henry Ford II. And eventually, as we all know, 1978, he was fired by Ford and hired by Chrysler. And what he found was a dysfunctional company where they didn't know how they were losing money. They didn't know what was going on. Manufacturing was tailor, uh, terrible. The, the relationship with the dealerships was terrible. And Iacocca had to come in and cut out a lot of um, excess executives, let's say, uh, at Chrysler who really weren't pulling their weight, bring his in his own people and revolutionize Chrysler, their sales, their manufacturing, their design process, and their marketing. And uncover those gems in the in the you know corporate ladder as well and by all measures he did a brilliant job and he came in in 1978 and in 1981 the k cars were released but let's roll back the clock a little bit because iacocca wasn't responsible directly for the k cars See, while he was at Ford, Iacocca is rightfully given credit for the Ford Mustang. And the story behind the Mustang is really simple. They identified a section of the market where people were moving to and then built a car for it. People were having more disposable income. They wanted a second car. They wanted something sporty. That's where the Mustang came in. And history records it was a fabulous decision and a huge success in the Mustang is still with us today. But one of the key people in that was a gentleman by the name of Hal Spurlick. I think I'm pronouncing that correct. If I'm not, please forgive me. But he was one of those key people involved in deciding, you know, could they use the Falcon platform to create the Mustang? Now, Hal was, as far as I can tell, brash and outspoken and did not defer to Ford. And they rubbed each other wrong. And so at one point, it got so ridiculous, according to Iacocca's autobiography, Ford told Iacocca that they couldn't sit together because he felt that Hal was whispering in his ear about products. Because both Iacocca and Hal believed that the world was moving to downsized, front-engine, efficient cars. And Ford didn't want to hear anything about it. They knew GM was moving that way, and they saw what was happening as the Japanese manufacturers began getting larger percentages of buyers because of the fuel crises. Ford didn't want to hear anything about it. After the Mustang, Hal moved up the ladder. He ended up heading uh, you know, products, I believe, for uh, Ford of Europe for a while. He was responsible for the Fiesta, but he really talked about a front-wheel drive, 
large inside, small outside car. Too expensive, Ford didn't want to hear anything about it. And then he also talked about something that was called the Minimax. Ford didn't want to hear anything about it. Reached a point where Iacocca was told Hal needs to be fired, and if you don't do it, you're going to get fired right now too. So Iacocca had to fire Hal. Hal went to work for Chrysler and was given free reign to start working on a project. Iacocca is fired. Iacocca goes to Chrysler, and he finds Hal there working on what became the K car. Now, the K car was designed not just to be front-wheel drive, efficient, reliable, easy to manufacture, cheap, profitable, but also to be flexible. Now, manufacturers have, for many decades, taken a platform and built something else out of it. Consider that Ford would turn one of their platforms into a Mercury and then into a Lincoln. In some cases, they would also take something like the Falcon and turn it into the Mustang. But this side-to-side -side flexibility was very common. Certainly you saw General Motors do it. They'd design a Chevy and make it into a Pontiac, a Buick, and an Oldsmobile. But up and down flexibility was a little bit less common. So Iacocca comes over to Chrysler, finds a mess, starts to fix it, starts layoffs, starts reductions, and still can't save the company based on the abysmal sales that they were having. And so there's a lot of history that's been written. He went to the government and asked for a loan. Long process, ended up getting $1.5 billion from the Carter administration, and they had to get $2 billion in loan commitments from banks. And one of the main ways they did this is to trot out the fact that they had the K car in development and that they were moving to small fuel efficient cars they were going to be able to compete with the Japanese head-to-head. -head. They got the loans. The K-Car finished development, and in 1981, the Plymouth Reliant and the Dodge Aries were released. Press was positive, tons of commercials. Famously, in the 80s, Iacocca would come forward in commercials. Oh, one more thing. If you can find a better car, buy it. It really resonated with Americans, and it was a huge, huge success. Within two years, the K-Car was providing more than 50% of Chrysler's profits, and they paid off their loans to the government two years early. Very famous photograph showing Iacocca in front of the big check. But that's not where the story ends, and that's honestly enough. I mean, I am not quite old enough to have owned a K-Car and I would have loved one. I, I wish there was a car like this that was available right now. Give me a reliable engine, transmission, basic car, space. It just doesn't really exist. Everything gets so swoopy and filled up with technology. This, this is really, really appealing. While it's very primitive to our current standards of what cars should be, there's something endearing about it. But what's amazing is, is how far Chrysler managed to stretch it. Now, I've read that the K-Car platform cost a billion dollars to develop. And even, that's a lot of money today, right? But you go back into those 70s, that's a ton of money, right? But once they did it, I've also read that they could design other cars off of it for about $50 million in investment. That's nothing in the automotive world. And Chrysler-based almost everything on the K-Car platform for the next 14 years. So in the 70s, Chrysler saw what was coming. Now, I think they were in some ways ahead of GM and Ford in seeing where the world was going. They started to bring the Dodge Omni over here from their European operations. They heavily revised it, but it still ended up looking the same. It was okay, and it sold until, I think, 1990, if I remember correctly, but it was never really, really a good car. They partnered with Mitsubishi, but that was never enough to stem the tide. They needed that American-built, compact, mid-size, large car to compete, and that's what the K-Car offered them. And after the K-Car was introduced, they started releasing variations of it. And this became a, a wagon, a two-door coupe, a Woody, a convertible, the LeBaron, a two-door semi-luxury coupe, the New Yorker. The K-Car was almost infinitely expandable. Now, was the 
say, Lancer ever competitive with the Mustang? No, not really. It was a front-wheel drive car. Was the New Yorker ever really comparable to a Mercedes? No. But it, it, it enabled Chrysler to expand their entire portfolio into cars to hit every single market and every single price range. Now, one of the criticisms would be that American manufacturers were really crappy for most of this time, and Chrysler was the worst of them, perhaps. But with the introduction of the K car, they really focused on quality, and they strove for the Japanese levels. I don't think they ever got there. K cars, certainly the K cars themselves, not the LeBarons and the New Yorkers and things like that, were largely average. Which means if the Japanese were up here and the other manufacturers were down here, Chrysler was right in the middle, which is not bad for the time. By the time this was actually ended, the K-Car platform was done away with. It had underpinned almost 50 different models of cars that Chrysler offered over a 14-year period. And most famously, and often forgotten, is the Chrysler minivans. From 19, excuse me, 1984 to 1995, the K car was the underpinnings of the minivan. The minivan was as influential in American life as the Mustang was two decades beforehand. This is the most important platform, in my opinion, perhaps in automotive history. Now, platform sharing up and down, you know, a, a vertical change in the car is not unheard of. You have very successful examples like the current Volkswagen platform that underpins the Golf and also underpins other Volkswagens and the Audi line, parts of the Audi line. But you have less successful examples. Uh, certainly with Mitsubishi, they came out with a platform which was the Gallant. They tried to turn it into the Eclipse and you ended up with something bloated, fat, and heavy. It was never really that efficient. The K car, from that perspective, looking back, was a revelation that they could stretch it and turn it into all of these different cars from the humble Aries to the New Yorker and still make something that was largely competitive. It wasn't class leading, it wasn't world changing, but it saved the company, propelled them to profitability and launched them, gave the money to launch those next generation of cars like the cloud cars and the LH cars, which were beautiful and fantastic. So I'd love to hear your opinions, your memories. Hey, if you disagree with me, keep it respectful. But I believe the K-Car was probably the most influential platform possibly in automotive history. And I'd love to hear your thoughts.